we'll try the flint fields now which is yep. uh, the third sparkling wine we're tasting today uh this is uh, again uh you know obviously all the names sort of reflect uh where we are on the history so you obviously canterbury Rose, which we're, we're near canterbury here in fact uh chalklands you know that's the nature of the land around here very much the chalky soil um, but the other interesting thing is that as we go to Flintfields, is uh, so if you visited the winery here, uh, just by our main gate is a lovely, uh, typical Kentish church made from flint, like a lot of buildings around here, made from flint uh, stones. It has a lovely copper uh, spire, which we can see uh, from both our vineyards. It's a real uh, local land landmark. Um, and particularly Roman Road, our Roman Road vineyard, it's um, uh, the soil is chalk, but it's it's flint encased in chalk. So flint is part of the soil as well, um, and so hence the name in flint fields. Uh, and this is our 2018. It's um, blanc de noir, so it's purely pinot noir. Uh, and the other interesting factor to it is that it's um, purely from uh, Burgundy clones. So they're not, we're not using the sparkling wine clones of, of Pinot Noir to make this, it's the Burgundy clones. So very um, uh, much, uh, is, you know, nice rich color to it. And then on the nose, you know, always for me um, uh, is, it reminds me of walking into a, a, you know, a lovely French patisserie. You get this mixture of sweet smells and savory smells and spice and freshly baked goods. Uh, you know, lots of, you know, uh, temptations. Um, so on me, for me on the nose, you get this um, lovely, almost red berry fruit, but then there's this spicy element to it, um, savory element, cinnamon almost um, coming through, which makes it different, you know, from the Dawkins we tasted just before. And, and that, you know, will continue to develop, you know, it's, um, you know, we released this wine in uh, October, November last year, and we know from the previous release that, you know, we'll continue to develop and uh, become even more complex and interesting. Um, so on the nose, uh, yeah, as I said, that lovely mixture of, sort of berry fruit, um, this spice, uh, and then uh, that patisserie smell, you know, people talk about almond poisson, things like that, and then, On the palate for me, what I like about this wine is in keeping with the fact that it's Pinot Noir, you get this lovely mouth-filling fruit and it fills the whole mouth. You know, compared to say a Blanc de Blanc or our Blanc de Blanc, which is often very linear, we're talking about being linear, this fills the whole mouth. Uh, and then the refreshing acidity kicks in uh, to, you know, to keep it nice and fresh and some of that spicy flavour and generosity is there. Right, and reasonably powerful, but without being overbearing, you know. So as an example, I, I recently, we did a wine dinner um, up at, in, uh, <coughs> in London at Sky Garden, their Fen Church restaurant at the top of there. And, you know, I love doing wine, uh, wine dinners because uh, the chef and the sommelier have tasted the wines and then they match, you know, your wines to the dishes. And it's always interesting to see um, what they match them with and how well they go. And, you know, for that wine dinner, we had a, a fantastic monkeyfish uh, dish with a slightly spicy sauce. Uh, so you've got this sort of meaty fish, spicy sauce. And then we had uh, with a glass of uh, Finfields, which has its own spice and had enough weight to, to balance out the spice. So it was really quite refreshing. And it was a good example of being able to, you know, enjoy a sparkling wine with, a, you know, with food. Absolutely. I think as soon as you said the fish, the monk that I, I was there, I completely got it because you got the mm. texture of the fish, slight bit of fattiness, but there's enough acidity within this wine that would cut mm. through and it would balance it out perfectly. Because yeah. that was the first thing I got was this, uh, quite punchy acidity, which is okay. I like that in our English sparkling wines. But again, it'd be a great mm. food pairing one. And another very easy yeah. one to drink, really smooth. Um, 
it's got a lovely zing again really nice zing on, on, yeah. on the yeah. palette a beautiful finish as well mm. so um the other sparkling wine we produce which we're not tasting today we've actually sold out of the um current release is our white cliffs uh, blanc to blanc, but I thought I'd mention it to round off our sparkling wines. You know, sure. we produce. So the blanc to blanc is purely Chardonnay, uh, purely sparkling wine clones. And again, um, you know, in terms of style, it spends uh, three years on leads and has real depth. But it has that, uh, it has a classic linear precision that you expect from a blanc to blanc. But at the same time, there's some really generous fruit flavours in there. So there's some tropical fruit uh, and a, a lovely amount of biscuit, biscuity character as well. So um, for those people that enjoy Blanc Blanc, they really would enjoy it. But, you know, it's just got a little bit more generosity than you might expect, particularly from an English sparkling wine. And that's one of the things we're finding with our sites here, that we do get this uh, a, a nice amount of ripeness and generosity that really works well with the natural acidity that you get in, in, in England. So, um, you know, sometimes I know, you know, uh, some of the, you know, we talked about the high levels of acidity in English wine. Sometimes it can be too bracing. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the Blanc de Blanc, I think is enough generosity to balance that out. It works really well. And it's been very well received. We'll have um, release our next one in two, uh, later this year, we're just going to monitor and see how it's progressing uh, in, 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 the, in the bottle. And which vintage? So uh, sorry? For the, so for the Blanc de Blanc, which vintage is that going to be when it's released? That'll be the 2018. So um, <coughs> again, uh, what we've experienced here you know, uh, so far, you know, our yeah. first harvest was in 2016, and that was a small crop, you know, it's the first crop, but it was very typical English summer with highs and lows, sunshine and rain. Uh, so a pretty good indicator of what we're going to get most, you know, many years, not all years. Uh, 2017, uh, we had the beast from the east that came in, which was the <laughs> atmospheric frost that affected a lot of vineyards in the south of uh, England. Uh, and, you know, for Charles and Ruth, it was a big wake up call because we, um, you know, they only got 30% of the crop. They didn't expect a huge crop, but they got 30% of what they expected. Having said that, the vines naturally, because they had a low crop, uh, stored that energy and carried that forth into the 2018, which was a fantastic summer, a uh, lovely long summer with plenty of sunshine and warmth. And that's when, um, you know, um, so those 2018 wines reflect that. Uh, but it's also a good... Um, uh, introductory point to say, you know, that's when um, Charles and Ruth, with these, you know, we had the perfect combination of really good fruit, good flavours and ripeness and lots of grapes in 2018. And that's when they was decided to make a range of still wines. Uh, having dabbled in the still wines in 16 and 17, just made a small amount. Uh, they saw the promise there and they, 2018 um, convinced them to make still wines using the burgundy clones that we have have here. So that's, um, uh, you know, I think a very good leading point to, to move on to the still wines, do you think, Guy? Absolutely, I was, I was just thinking that, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just got another glass, bear with me. I'm pleased that Simpsons has decided to dedicate a lot of the great sources that you have on stills because 
the majority of people do focus on sparkling. There's a very good reason for that. But we can produce amazing still wines in England, and it's still something that people are getting used to. So when I came across your wines for the first time, I thought, this is brilliant. Somebody who's got a real focus on stills. So, yeah, absolutely. this is going to be a great opportunity to go through them with you. Well, it, it, it is, you know, it's also, um, uh, as we were saying before, um, you know, it's also about, uh, as I mentioned before, is dealing with what's in front of you, what the vineyard is capable of. So, as I said initially, with the Spark and Wine project, but lo and behold, you know, you because the, the, the Charles and Ruth planted the Burgundy uh, clones as well as the Spark and Wine clones, and because of the size, you know, where they are, that we've been able to get. Uh, fruit ripe enough, uh, that changed, um, you know, changed things. And, you know, so, well, hang on, you know, we started off just wanting to make sparkling wine, but look, we can get ripeness, enough ripeness and flavour to produce, you know, uh, still wines. And, you know, uh, and that's where the change came in to, to, to uh, respond to the fruit that we're getting and then work on that. And also, um, you know, um, you know, Lee the wife and Charles and Ruth, um, you know, it, it was about producing wines that have balance. We could see we get enough ripeness. And, uh, but also about texture, very much, very important with our still wines is to balance, you know, you can get the fruit flavors, you can get the natural acidity, but it's trying to get that texture and um, mouthfeel that balances that out and brings it all together. And, and that's what makes, um, you know, I think one of the attractions of our still wines that people um, find them much more enjoyable to drink. Uh, the acidity is not so aggressive and they <coughs> enjoy the fruit flavors and the texture. And a lot of what we've been trying to do here with the still wines, uh, you know, and we're still experimenting, you know, and, and working on improving on, uh, is to provide that balance and that texture that makes the wines appealing. Um, so the first wine we're gonna taste in our still wines is our Daringstone uh, Pinaminier which is really interesting um, and it's named after an area uh, attached to the, the village of um, Barham. Uh, so there's a hamlet that's now part of the village called Daringstone. So again, it's a local name. It comes in a, a, a lovely, um, uh, very stylish bottle with a glass stopper. And the history behind this, um, uh, this style of wine is that um, Charles and Ruth had been given a German version at one stage of a white Pinot Minier. So this is a white wine made from a red variety. And uh, they enjoyed it so much that they decided we'd, we'd try to make one in 2018. And that was successful. And in fact, uh, the 2018 version won a gold medal in the Sommelier Wine Awards. And very much enjoyed by sommeliers because they find it quite different uh, in terms of flavor and fruit profiles and very suitable for going with food, uh, matching food. Um, so 18 and 19 they made it. Then this is the uh, 2020, which uh, I always talk about um, um, uh, creating, a, uh, getting people into uh, mental gymnastics, because what we're talking about here is a white wine that's made from a red variety, but for this particular year, it has a pink tinge to it. So, you know, to make the white wine, we need to get the juice away from the skins as quickly as possible. Some years, um, as happens in vineyards, you have heightened amount of color in your red varieties, which is great when you're making uh, a red wine, but it can cause problems if you're trying to make a white wine. Uh, but, and hence it has a slight, it has a pink tinge to it, but it's been made as a, as a white wine. Um, and then on the nose, we talk about this, you know, it's very different from a Sauvignon Blanc or a Chardonnay or any other, you know, uh, other varieties. It's got um, poached uh, pear or poached winter fruit, fruit uh, sort of aromas, a bit of spiciness and salinity on the nose, quite aromatic. And then on the palate, this lovely fruit. As again, it's sort of a mixture of red fruit, poached pear, there's some spice, uh, lovely creamy texture to it, and then the acidity just kicks in uh, and, 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 and stops it being too unctuous. 
a really good mouthfeel that goes on. And, you know, part of that is from um, you know, a lot of our whites uh, is leaving um, the, the, the wine on leaves for extended periods in tank, even sometimes agitating it to mix it up. And that just provides that other depth, uh, a little bit of complexity, and that uh, softens it off a bit and provides that lovely texture. Um, so it's one of those wines that I, you know, it is different uh, and, and um, uh, really interesting, but not so interesting that it's not enjoyable. It's an attractive wine as well. And, you know, it goes really well with uh, food, uh, pork dishes particularly, but I also like it with, um, you know, mildly spicy, spicy dishes, say mildly spicy Thai food or Malay soups or bay, something like that. And obviously richer uh, seafood dishes. And also, um, you know, again, referring to some wine dinners I've done, we've got a Michelin star restaurant uh, near us down the road called the Hyde and Fox. And uh, two years in a row, we've done wine dinners. He's matched, uh, Alistair, the chef there, matched this wine with a, a beetroot dish and goat's cheese dish. Um, and that's worked really well, can handle those earthy flavors as well. So it's been, you know, really interesting wine to match with food. That would be a lovely pairing, goat's cheese and beetroot, because those are, I mean, those are wonderfully tart. They're very robust flavours, both of those. What's yeah, most... I mean, very, it was very clever in not having the goat's cheese too strong. So he had milder goat's cheese, so it wasn't overpowering, because goat's cheese can be a nightmare to match a wine. Um, and then, so he had this year, a, a, a beetroot salad with a goat um, curd, um, and then uh, some wasabi snow on the top of it, which is really interesting, a bit of horseradish. So. It's a very smooth white wine. I was expecting it to have more acidity than it does, um, which mm. is interesting, as you say, the fact it can pair so well with something like beetroot, which is quite earthy and there's a very heavy texture there, and the same thing with goat's cheese. But I totally see yeah. that because it's, it's got enough depth, there's enough of a body to it. It's a very well-balanced wine. So it's, it's quite soft. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is it, it's not too punchy. It's not too yeah. uh, dominating. You know, it's not demanding your attention. If you like. like some wines are far too acidic. This is very yeah. mellow is probably the word I would use, which is really yeah. nice because it makes it very enjoyable. It's, it's, a, it's a good drinking wine, not just a drink. And one of the other interesting things we've found with this wine is, uh, you know, it's one of our most esoteric wines, but, uh, you know, this is our third release. And it's wine that actually develops quite quickly in the bottle without losing its freshness. So it develops tertiary flavors. So, you know, after, you know, in six months time, this wine will have even more interesting flavors to it without losing, because of the acidity, it won't lose that freshness to it. So it's quite a really interesting wine. I just, I, I completely agree with you and I can see and tell already how it's opening up in the glass more. It's already revealed more than it did when I first had it. So I, I think this is a, a wine to open, allow it to breathe a bit, to, to, to come to life, to regain, or rather allow it to draw out what's happening within there, because there's, there's much oh, yes. more I mean, it's, Yeah, I, two things. We, we will generally suggest don't serve, it with, don't serve it too cold. So, you know, about the same <clears> temperatures <throat> you would a white burgundy. You know, a little Absolutely. Espresso. And like a good curry, it's usually better on the second day after it's been open for a while. Yeah, I can totally see how this wine will improve once it's opened. I mean, because again, between the, the initial tastes and the, the first sip to where we are now, it's already softened and it's already, you know, the oxygen has allowed it to develop a bit more, but also having the ability to swirl it in the glass so it can just lift yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, very lovely, smooth. Again, that's the main, main thing I pick up from this wine. Oh, glad you're enjoying it. Um, right, next, where would you like to go? So next wine, well, I want to talk about Chardonnay um, and then this part of of Kent, you know, one of the, there's some very exciting Chardonnay that's being produced here. Um, you know, we've got <coughs> Chapel Downs, it's Cozy Chardonnay, which is um, really good and very interesting. And we've got Gusborne near Ashford, who produce Guinevere Chardonnay, which is a very exciting wine as well. 
So I think, you know, there's real, uh, there's, there's a bit of excitement, I think, about some of the wine press and people in the trade about the potential and al already of um, making really fine Chardonnay here in camps uh, on these chalk soil, well, not necessarily chalk soil, but just in, in this part of the world. So uh, in terms of still wines, in 2016 and 17, um, Charles and Ruth made a small, small amount of, of uh, Chardonnay from Burgundy clients, still Chardonnay. And we're really pleased you know, with the, firstly, uh, the, the wine, but also the response to it, uh, which encouraged them. And so in 2018, as I mentioned before, where we had uh, really good flavours, uh, uh, ripeness and lots of grapes, we decided to make two styles of Chardonnay. Uh, one called the Gravel Castle, which is purely about fruit, uh, capturing that fruit flavour, so it's quite Chablis-like. And the other one is the Roman Road, named after the vineyard, purely Burgundy clone from one sort of, initially um, uh, um, from one corner of the Roman Road vineyard, where it gets lovely and ripe and generous. And the Roman Road is more white Burgundy in style, uh, in that it's, um, you know, as an example, the 2020 we're tasting now, 25% uh, has been um, uh, fermented in oak. We've got these la larger oak fermenters that we uh, fermented in. 25% uh, of it has been uh, matured in second and third use barrels. So we use uh, barrels that are, have already been used for another wine, generally down in the south of France, they're bringing them up here. And uh, so it's not um, too overbearing for the delicate, well, reasonably delicate fruit, although we've got good fruit flavours. And about 50% uh, spends uh, is fermented and stays in stainless steel to capture that fruit. But I mentioned to you before, you know, we had the, uh, the inertis system where we can use the nitrogen gas in the press to capture the fruit. And what we found over here is that if, particularly with Chardonnay, if we use the inertis um, uh, nitrogen, we get very fresh citrusy mineral flavors in Chardonnay. And if you don't use it, you get more tropical fruit. So by alternating using it, not using it, we can build up a complex um, fruit flavor, fruit profile in the, in the Chardonnay. Other things we use to add depth and complexity to it is um, we do a small amount with using the ambient yeast that we have here, um, you know, often called wild yeast. Why is it called wild yeast? Well, it just lives in the air, but it does mutate, it does, uh, it can create a, a very strange flavors. So you don't risk your whole crop with it. So we just use a small amount every year. And um, they found that it's been very positive and just adds another dimension to uh, particularly the Roman Road Chardonnay. We leave, use a little bit, uh, some of the grapes are left on skins in our picking bins for two or three days, just to macerate, and then they ferment it. So what I'm saying is that we, particularly with the Roman Road, we're building up a wine with lots of layers and depth and, and um, flavours and, and complexity. So hopefully, yeah. So for me, um, you know, the 2020, we had, you know, may remember from uh, lockdown, it was a very sunny a growing period, lovely sunshine, and um, not, not as warm as 2018, but we got some really good, nice, generous, very characterful um, flavours in the Chardonnay. So it has a lovely green, a goldy green uh, look to it. It promises some really fairly rich uh, flavour. And on the nose, it's just one of those wines you keep swirling around. You get citrus, you get um, tropical fruit. There's a nuttiness that comes from the oak. There's some spice, a little bit that hits spice. It just hits the back of the nose. Not, not too aggressively. And you just swirl it and you get something different there every, every time. And it's really coming together. When I first tasted this wine, oh, it's probably about six months ago, uh, it had all the components of a really good wine, but they were swirling around. It's now becoming more and more integrated. They're coming together in one. Uh, and uh, you know, that will continue to, um, uh, that process will continue for months and years ahead. So that's on the nose and then on the palate. There's an intense fruit. There's a little bit of fine tannin, 
you know, a little bit of tannin on the side, slightly drying. Um, there's a nuttiness and creaminess and the acidity there keeps it all fresh again. And then you're left with that fruit afterwards. So plenty going on, uh, fantastic with uh, rich, richer dishes. So you, you've got enough richness there to go with a rich fish or poultry dish with a creamy sauce, but the acidity is there to cut through that rich sauce and it works really well together. You know, sometimes with a, from a warmer climate, you have these um, chardonnays that are very generous, lovely, and you know, I like them in certain situations, but if you're having a rich creamy dish, uh, they, the wine and the dish becomes too much together. Uh, and, and you think, well, I don't know if I'm gonna, you know, get through this, but with this sort of wine, it really works. So, and that is, and I have to say, sorry, go ahead. No, as you said, I mean, that is key. It's something we've mentioned a lot, and it is balance how the wine can play with yeah. the food, and the food can play with the wine. And as you said, if you have two very bold pairings, like a, a very strong, in the white burgundy, for example, touching wine speaking, and some big bold food, it can be too much. And that is where this mm. wine has achieved a, a nice subtle balance within itself. It is quite soft. Yeah. There's enough going on there that it won't be drowned out by food, but I can't see it overtaking it. Um, it's yeah. a very interesting wine to have. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's where English, you know, good quality English Chardonnay is going to come in is, is this refreshment factor to it. And it makes it different from Chardonnays from other part, parts of the world. So you do have that citrusy slightly um, and that lovely acidity, but the right fruit there as well. Um, and that makes it all, all work together. Um, and there is just in the background a slight struck match character, which sometimes can be overpowered, but I think it's just in the background. And again, it adds that sort of complexity. Really, you know, as a, as a guest in this country, and I come from, uh, you know, further south in Australia, you know, to see wines like this being made in England is really, really exciting. And I'm, you know, very um, glad to be, part, you know, part of, not that I'm making, necessarily making the wine, but to see these made here. Uh, it's really, really exciting to go out and show people these sort of wines. And, you know, they're only going to get better and better, I feel, you know, just in general. Not, it not feels like a good leap part. forward, I think, with a wine like mm. this, because it, it's it's moved past the firm crisp acidity that I think a lot of people have gotten used to. Yeah. As you say, it'd be a good, a good introductory wine to raise a few eyebrows, no doubt. Yeah. And, you know, one of the key things we have here, as I said, I think it's about the size. We're able to get this ripeness, uh, even in a cooler year, we, we found that we've got some consistency going. We can get enough ripeness to make these sort of styles of wine. Uh, at the same time, because it's England and growing conditions will vary more than in other places, you're going to get uh, differences from year to year, which makes it even more interesting. I think, you know, that you're not going to get the same thing every year. Um, so it makes it more interesting for those people that are into, into, their, into their wines. But we can consistently get, you know, it's really charming. And you know, um, uh, you know, we think we've got the right sites for it. So it's really. But that that is what's key is focusing on the sites that you have. What great varieties will work there, and then not fighting about. You can do a lot in the winemaking process, but you, once you've got the vineyard right, I imagine that's the hardest part. Yeah. Getting the correct site, getting the correct uh, great varieties that are going to suit the terroir. And then, you know, you started right, essentially, and I, I, there's been a lot of experimentation very early on in the English wine industry, understandably, but I, it definitely seems that now the vineyard managers, the winemakers, everybody understands more what is possible from our terroir, and therefore yeah. the style of wines that can then be produced. And I, I imagine it's a, it's a good way to leap forward with less experimentation, and it's great that wines like this are now being produced because of that. Yes, no, I think it's all about nurturing, you know, the, what you, you've got to have good grapes to start with, and then you nurture that in the winery um, and, and capture those, the essence, the flavours there and work with them without, um, you know, doing too much work. You know, you've got to let that fruit express itself, and that's what people like most when they see that fruit expressing itself. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have a real sense of place. You know, this, this is, um, you know, uh, what this the, this part of the world is capable of producing, which is different from you know other, other vineyards in England, but you know also you know English wine would be different from other parts of the world. So, um, so uh, 
having discussed Chardonnay, um, you know, as you know, Guy, to make a red wine in, in England is, is difficult. To make a very good one is extremely difficult. Uh, you know, it's all about um, being able to get enough ripeness uh, in, in the grapes. So uh, what happened here, we, in 2018, I mentioned that great um, you know, summer we had, and on the railway hill vineyard, I meant to mention that you know, it's called railway hill because we used, there used to be a light railway that ran from uh, Canterbury down to Folkestone along the beautiful Elam Valley. And uh, the railway hill vineyard has a sort of ridge running through it about a third of the way up the hill where you can see where the railway used to run. Um, so it's known as the railway hill vineyard. And in 2018, uh, up in the top left hand corner, uh, some of the first crop uh, Pinot Noir Burgundy clone got some really nice richness and intensity in the fruit, and it was decided then, you know, you know um, to make a small batch of red wine and see how it went. Uh, so, having made that decision, um, you know, Pinot Noir loves cool climate uh, to express itself, and loves to <coughs> where it expresses itself the best. And um, it was hand picked, brought to the, you know, the, 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 the the view was it was going to be hand picked and brought to the winery. Now, of course, uh, the winery was uh, set up for sparkling wine and making white wine, uh, but not for red wine. And it was thought bringing the whole bunches down to the winery, and what you'd normally do is you'd put it into an open fermenter and it would steep for a couple of days and macerate uh, and start bringing out the color and the flavors, and then you'd start the fermentation. Concern was because of the cool climate of England. That the stalks wouldn't be ripe enough and you'd get green astringent flavours. And I think there's been some of the problems in the past with reds in England. So it was decided to distem the, you know, take the berries off the stalks. Now we didn't have a crusher distemmer here because we we're not geared up for red wine at that stage. So it was decided to uh, bring up a crusher distemmer from uh, Domain St. Rose, uh, Charles and Ruth's. A French domain uh, down in the south of France, a thousand miles up here to make a small batch of red wine so we could take the stalks off effectively off the berries, which was done. Uh, the berries were put into a tank and sat there for a couple of days. And then you add the yeast and it starts fermenting, forms a raft at the top. Uh, we then pump over once or twice a day to help keep that raft at, uh, at the top moist, but also to extract the color and the flavors. And the result was our first uh, red wine called Rabbit Hole. Believe it or not, there is a road near here called Rabbit Hole. So that's <laughs> why I went. You can go down the Rabbit Hole if you want when you visit here. Uh, and, um, you know, again, it was all about capturing that bubbly fruit uh, and producing, uh, you know, an enjoyable and balanced uh, red wine. I'm just going to pour myself a glass. Um, so this is 2020. Uh, first I've already had, I snuck in there slightly ahead of you whilst you were chatting sure. and uh, okay. wonderfully smooth. Really, really enjoyed that. It, again, because sometimes it, it can be off balance, but it, it's um, lovely aromas, really, really soft and subtle. And this beautiful sweet beetroot on the palate. I mean, sorry, I'll let you carry on, but I just, that immediately hit me. So I thought I'd... No, no, that's right. I'm glad. It, it's got you gushing. You know, it's, 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 that's a good sign when a wine yeah. uh, um, inspires uh, uh, description and chatter. Um, so, I mean, the first thing to notice, it's from 2020. It has a reasonably light colour, but it's very bright. You know, it shines across the room. We've, you know, when we do tasting, you can see it in my hand here. Um, you know, people really... Uh, you know, find it appealing to see that sort of colour that shines across, across the room. And then on the nose is this lovely, um, you know, dark cherry, um, cranberry sort of red fruit on the nose. And there's a smoky spiciness that comes from, you know, small, spends a very small uh, time in, in oak, um, but it has that sort of spicy, charry uh, character. But again, it doesn't dominate the fruit. It's just there as part of one of the components, you know, we want to, um, capture you know the vibrant fruit and, and one of the most exciting things again for me uh, is that you know, I love Pinot Noir and then this is very varietal in that you've got these classic Pinot Noir uh, aromas coming out of the wine so it doesn't you know, um, you know some of the 
English red wines I've tasted over the years, some have been really quite good, but some are not so good. But even the good ones, you'd be very hard pressed to think, describe what you know, what variety it's made from. It's been made more in the winery than in the vineyard. So hopefully um, you're seeing those classic Pinot Noir flavours. And then on the palate, it is. It's classic Pinot Noir for England, and that's what's great about mm. it, because we can't mm. compete with mm. Burgundy, and I think the closest comparison that we could possibly get to is perhaps a New Zealand Pinot Noir, but obviously they have a yeah. much stronger sun over there, so they're going to get much more yeah. whiteness of fruit, more development. Yeah. The point is we need to be able to make exceptional Pinot Noir in our cool climate, and we yeah. can't be too comparative I think with these other wine regions for, for what I've just said but this is a lovely wine yeah. it's very well balanced and as I say the sweet beetroot really smooth subtle lovely warm raspberries as well it's a very pleasing finish and a good mouthful as well I'll let you carry on before I interject too much yeah yeah so uh, there, there's that fruit on the on the palate uh really nice uh, fine tannin so there's a little bit of grip on the side but not aggressive, a harsh green tannin. Uh, there's a bit of spice there, and the oak kits in it. And there's also an acidity there that keeps it fresh as well. But you know, again, it's a pretty, it's a smooth, it's it's very integrated or balanced. So there's no sharp edges or anything like that. It's not just disjointed. It's come together really nicely, and you know, lovely with uh, you know. Duck or pigeon works really well. I've had it with um, very rare roast beef, thinly sliced. It works really well with that. Um, but, you know, mushroom risotto or something like that works really well as well. Um, and, it, you know, as I said before, very exciting to see wine um, made like this in, in the UK, uh, in England. Um, and, you know, when we made the first one in 2018, it was, you know, because the fruit was ripe enough and it was an opportunity. We weren't sure uh, how successful it would be. Uh, and if we would get that every year. Uh, 2019 was a cooler year. We were able to, we couldn't make as much, but we were able to get some nice, ripe, intense fruit flavours uh, so we could make another one. 2020, plenty of sunshine and um, uh, a couple of other areas of, you know, with Pinot Noir has come on stream that were producing ripe enough flavours to contribute to the rabbit hole. So uh, in the, what you see there. And the word is, uh, you know, from this year, you know, uh, if you talk to uh, wine producers in the UK, it's been a very difficult, I mean, when I say this year, last year, 2021, a very difficult um, growing season, you know, lots of mildew around, which has caused problems. And, um, you know, some people aren't making still wines and some people aren't, haven't met, been able to make wine at all. Um, but we've found on our railway hill vineyard, you know, the winemaker was saying just a couple of days ago, there's our second section, the 2017 section, which has some dips in, in it on the side of the hill, uh, low cropping. I mean, this is one of the keys. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, it's forced by nature, which happens this year. Uh, but we really also have to keep the cropping level down to get those flavours. And the, this 2021, the, the word in the winery, this is the best pin wine we've made so far. So we're pretty excited. So that's four years in a row we've been able to make a red wine. We're not expecting to be able to do it every year, but so far, so good. And again, it might point to the fact that we've got uh, a sites that can be really consistent. So there you are. So it's really, really exciting. And, uh, you know, uh, when I joined um, Charles and Ruth uh, a few years ago, um, you know, we we're talking about working for them, and uh, then they showed me the range of wines, and I, I, I was really impressed uh, with the, the quality and the consistency. You know, each wine was different, but there was, you know, they were all very good. And I thought, yes, I, I think I can sell these. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, um, so, sorry, I was going to say, I think it's the, the, the perfect way to have wrapped up the tasting to finish with this red because it, it's really, it's just rounded it off well. There's so many wonderful characteristics to the wine. Um, I, was, I thought of, um, or rather, excuse me, what's coming next for Simpsons? Now, as you said, we've had slightly more challenging recent growing season, but what are the future plans? 
Well, um, yeah, just going back slightly, uh, you know, what's next? Uh, what we did, we've released last, uh, last year. Um, we made a small, very limited amount of, uh, of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, now released under our Q class label in Magnum. So Q class is named after locomotives that used to run down the light railway from Canterbury to, um, to Folkestone. So it's named after that. And again, what was found from our railway hills now, there are a couple of patches that got really ripe in 2020 and uh, slightly different fruit flavors. And so uh, it was decided to make a very small amount and, and um, treat it slightly differently because again, reflecting the fruit flavor. So it's, it's looking at what you've got in front of you, right, how do we treat this? Rather than blinking approach saying, bang, this is how we do it, bang, this is how we do it. Sure. So um, the winemaking crew look at this two parcels of fruit, only a small amount, but we're going to approach it this way. And um, so the Q class Chardonnay um, in the Magnum is very different from our Roman Road. It's got really ripe tropical fruit. And I have to say, if you tasted it in a blind tasting, you'd be hard pressed to say it's from England. Maybe it's the future of England. This is what we can do in the future. And the same with the Pinot Noir, it's very aromatic. It's got a dark color, sort of plummy character color. It's less of that spice that you see in Rabbit Hole. It's more about lovely root, ripe, not root, ripe, velvety fruit. Um, so that's, you know, that's very exciting. And maybe, you know, it, it's very limited release and a few people have, have seen the wines and really have been impressed by them. And I think they will change the perception again, of uh, still wines and what's possible in England. So that's, they've come out, uh, which is very exciting. Um, for the future, uh, uh, one of the things we're trying to do, because we've realised the vagary of the England climate here uh, and the demand for our wines, that, uh, even though we've got uh, um, uh, 90 acres of vineyard here, we need, we need more vineyard to be able to uh, produce to meet demand every year and we want to have control over our, our own vineyards so uh, we're in the process of, fingers crossed it will go through shortly uh, there's a parcel of land uh, about a half a mile down the road from here towards the village of Bridge which is on the same ridge as Roman Road uh, uh, about eight hectares of, um, of chalk south facing chalk soil uh, land and we're going to plant that purely to Burgundy clone Chardonnay. Um, so uh, well, that's very exciting. So that will come on stream in the years to come. Um, so it's about the future for Simpsons is uh, um, you know, looking after our existing customers, uh, talking about what we're doing, uh, uh, not resting on our laurels. It's always about trying to improve all the time. Uh, and, and as I said, there's a vineyard that matures. And we get to know that more, you know, the quality keep going up. I'm pretty sure, um, and you know, finessing what we're doing at the moment. But you know, Charles and Ruth are pretty open-minded, and you know, we've done a fair few experiments already. So there's always going to be something new in the pipeline, um, which makes it very exciting. Thank we're you. also members of the Wine Garden of England, which is you know, when, when Charles and Ruth um, uh, first came to Kent, uh, they. Uh, went round and introduced themselves to some of the larger estates uh, to pick their brains, but also, to, you know, to, to meet them, introduce themselves and pick their brains. And Charles asked them how often do they meet? Because, you know, most wine regions have a producers group which meets and they exchange ideas and lobby governments and promote tourism. But uh, that wasn't in place. So he set about helping um, set up what's called the Wine Garden of England uh, with some of the uh, larger estates here, but we're now taking on another as a new member, so there were seven originally, um, ourselves, Gusbourne, a uh, very good producer, Biddenden, Chapel Down, uh, Balfour Hush Heath, um, and Square is up near Seven Oaks, and, uh, and a member from day one, which is very exciting for this region, has been um, the joint venture between the family owned uh, Champagne House Tattinger and its importer, Hatch Mansfield, British importer, uh, so they've, been, uh, they've got an estate called Domain Everond, 
they don't um, release their first wine until 2023, but they've been members from day one of the Wine Garden of England, which is very exciting. And then we're just uh, about to announce the uh, join uh, of Westworld, which is a very interesting producer near us, near Ashford, who are quite um, edgy, cutting edge style winemakers, uh, but very much get the idea of promoting the region together. So it's very exciting. So there's some, um, you know, I suggest to your viewers, uh, keep an eye on the Wine Garden of England and for events, because it's a very good opportunity to try wines from uh, now eight great estates in, in Kent in one place. So that's coming up as well. It, it sounds great. I mean, lots more to come from the industry, but also from the individual producers. Yeah. And as you say, the Wine Garden of England that you've created. Thank you so much for sending these wines through. It's been an absolute treat and it's been wonderful to hear so much. Uh, he talks so intensely, particularly about all the still wines. We can really push them out there. And um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Guy. Um, you know, thank you for inviting us on. Uh, thank you for all your work promoting English wine. I certainly appreciate it. And, you know, um, it's all about getting people to, to know the wines and get excited about them. Uh, make friends one by one, really, almost. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your work. We appreciate thank you. it.